Open your Bible, if you will, to the fourth book in the New Testament, the Gospel according to John, and go to John chapter 14. When you get to John chapter 14, Jesus is in Bethany. Bethany is just east, location-wise, of Jerusalem, near the Mount of Olives, only about two miles outside of the town. The scene that we're going to look at today is in the house of Simon the leopard. He had been healed of leprosy by the Lord. And so Simon invites Jesus and a few of his close friends, uh, Jesus' close friends, Lazarus, Martha, Mary, and the disciples. You know, it only stands to reason that once you invite Jesus into your heart, you, you invite Jesus into your home. Well, Jesus is invited to supper, and just for a moment, just listen to me as I listen to some of the conversations that I think could very well have taken place there. I can hear Simon saying, Jesus, you probably hear this all the time from your disciples, but I just want to thank you once again for touching my body and healing me from the leprosy. I can hear Lazarus saying, Jesus, I'm eternally grateful for the day that you brought me back from the dead and gave me a second chance on life. Mary's heart was so overwhelmed with love for Jesus that she gets up and she leaves, and after a while she returns with an alabaster box filled with very expensive perfume. With that in mind, let's pick up in verse number three. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come before to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now, I want us to look closely at this lady's life and find out what was it about her life and what she did that was so incredibly important in God's economy that God said, wherever the gospel is preached, this also is going to be told of what this lady, it's going to be a memorial for her. I begin in your notes with uh, one introductory statement, and the statement is this. Mary is mentioned three times in Scripture, and every time she is sitting at Jesus' feet. You only find her name mentioned three times, and every time she's sitting at his feet. The first time, number one, she's, we find her listening to Jesus. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 39, the Bible says, Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She listened to Jesus. Secondly, when Lazarus had died, she's sitting at his feet and she's filled with sorrow. John eleven thirty two. 32, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell down at his feet. And then thirdly, we see her the third time and she's worshiping Jesus. John chapter 12 and verse 3, 
Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. Let me just pause for a moment. This, this spikenard or pure nard was a very costly commodity. In fact, what Mary had was one year's wages of, a, of the average uh, a man's uh, laboring man. In other words, one man would work one year in order to pay for what Mary had in that alabaster box, that ointment. In fact, Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, uh, I mean, this stuff was so expensive, it could have fed the 5,000 men, the women, and the children, and still had about a third of it left over. In Mark chapter 6, verse 37 when they didn't have any food, uh, 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 Jesus, uh, uh, one of the disciples said, shall we go and, and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Well, what Mary does is she breaks that alabaster box. She doesn't take the lid off. She breaks it. She pours it over the head of Jesus, anointing him. And she pours the residue on her feet and takes her long, silky black hair that by now is mingled with both perfume and tears, and she wipes the feet of Jesus. You see, Mary understood that Jesus was going to die. She understood what even the others in that room hadn't figured out yet. Well, some of the Individuals criticize her and says it's a waste. Why didn't, why didn't she take this money and, and, and buy food and give it to the poor? And Jesus says, Live, leave her alone. She's done a good work. She's anointed my body for burial. And wherever the gospel is preached, what she has done is going to be told as a memorial for me. Now, what I want to do is I want to break this down because there are five important questions that need to be asked. In other words, what was it about this woman and what was it about what she did? This one woman's memorial that Jesus said, wherever the gospel is going to be preached, you're going to hear about this. Because you know what? I realize that in a crowd this size, there's some ladies, there's some men. And we think, what do we have to offer? I mean... I'm just, I mean, who am I? You're going to see today exactly how God used an individual and why God used that individual and how he could use that individual. And may we walk out of these doors today, get in our car and drive off of these 22 beautiful acres, committed, come hell or high water, Never again to say, well, who am I? What have I to offer? So let's ask these five questions, okay? The first one, number one, who was this woman? Who was this woman? And here's the answer. She was a very ordinary person. Yes, her name is Mary, but she was a very ordinary person. Her sister, Martha, was a, was a, was a very gifted uh, individual. I mean, she was so efficient. Martha, if she was alive today, she probably would have been the co-founder of Pinterest. She would have probably had her own cooking show on the Food Network. I mean, she's the kind of lady that, I mean, her house is all clean by 8.30 in the morning. If she had a maid that would come, she'd still clean the house so her maid would not find anything out of order. Mary was not like that. But don't think that because Mary was ordinary that she didn't do anything that could make a mark on eternity. Here's the key. I put it in your notes. She has done, Jesus said, what she could. What she could. You ought to capitalize she. Maybe put all the letters capitalized. Because in verse number eight, notice what Jesus said. She has done what she could. Jesus didn't say, 
She, she didn't do what someone else could. You know, there's an old gospel song that says, if just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I will demand. And you know the reason she had that alabaster box? Is because in the providence of God, it had already been given to her. We don't know why. It may have been a dowry. It may have been an inheritance. All I know is this. Everything else she owned in life didn't mount to anything near the value of that ointment, that spikenard in that alabaster box. You see, folks, God never demands of us anything that he has not already given us. Mary was just an ordinary person. She did what she could do. And so maybe the first question I want to ask every one of us is this. Have you done what you could do? Not what your spouse could do, not what your parents, not what your sibling, not what your best friend. As you sit here today, have, have you done what you could do? Second question. First one, who is this woman? A very ordinary person. Question number two, why did she do it? I mean, how did Mary know to do what she did? The answer is this. She had penetrating insight. Others could have known it, but they didn't know it. And so you ask, well, why did Mary know? Because she had been sitting at Jesus' feet. Every time in the Bible, get this, now, folks, don't miss this, please. Every time that she is mentioned, she's sitting at Jesus' feet. Over in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38, Martha welcomes Jesus into her house, and the Bible says in verse number 38, now it happened as they went that Jesus entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Y you know what Mary loved to do as a lady, as a person? I mean, do you know what she loved to do more than anything else? She loved to sit and listen to Jesus. I remember in my own life, I'm in my first pastorate. I'd been saved for, I don't know, six, I, I think six, seven years. And all I knew is that uh, I do remember the moment, not today, but the moment when God said, Ken, I don't want you to preach. I don't want you to, I don't want you to study your Bible I know you're trying to make up for the, all those years you lost. I don't want you to study your Bible to preach messages. I want you to study the Bible to get to know me. I don't want you to come to the Bible out of duty or because it's your job description. I want you to come and open your Bible because you want to listen to me. You can't drum that up on yourself. You can't just one day say, well, you know what? Uh, that, that comes by God's grace. And I tell you today that God can take someone who reads the Bible and, but doesn't, doesn't above everything else love to just sit and listen to God, but God can change that person and do in their life what he did in Mary's life. And thank God he did it with me. Verse 40 says, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. You can just see Martha coming out of the, the kitchen. I mean, she's perspiring. 
the perspiration's coming off of her brow. Her hands are probably have flour on them. And I mean, she's just, you know, and she can, you can just see her. She's got her hands on her hips and she says, Jesus, would you tell Marth, Mary to come and help me? I mean, I'm, I'm working hard out there. Verse 41. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. You see, folks, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether you're a prized cook, whether your yard is the most beautiful yard in the neighborhood. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day how much money you have at the bank, in the bank, how many people speak your name with pride, how beautiful you are, how handsome you are how gifted, how efficient you are. Those things, they can all be taken away. But Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. And because of that, she gleaned and gained penetrating insight into the ways and the will of God. So much that she knew that Jesus was going to be crucified and that his body needed to be anointed None of the others knew that because they hadn't been sitting at the feet of Jesus. She did what she did. You know why? Because she had been in communion with Jesus. I put in your notes, it's not enough to do something for Jesus. You have to do what he wants done. Jesus said this, Himself in John chapter uh, 8 and verse 29, he said this about his relationship with the Father. He said, I always, say the word always. always. Notice what he said. I always do those things that please him. Heard the story about two little Boy Scouts that, you know, they were instructed by the, the, the head of uh, their camp or whatever it was called, uh, you know, to do a good deed every day. And so one day they came back and, man, they were all beat up. Their clothes were torn. And the mother says, what's wrong? She said, well, we, we went out to do a good deed. Well, well what, what did you do? And he said, well, we helped this little old lady going across the street. And, and, and mom said, well, I know, but that's wonderful, but why... How did everything get torn up? They said, well, she didn't want to go. <laughs> you know, I'm afraid many times we're doing things that the Lord doesn't want us doing because we've not been at his feet, quiet before him. Listen to me very carefully. God is a lot more concerned with what you become than what you do. And you will only become what God wants you to become by sitting at his feet and listening to him. And you can't muster that up yourself, folks. You just got to just, you know, the Bible says we have not because we ask not. And just if you don't have, just say, Lord, would you please give me, change my heart. Make this the priority. I put in your notes, how you answer this question will have an enormous impact on your life. And here's the question I'm asking. Do you have a time alone with God? Do you have a time alone with God? I'm talking about a time, listen, when you get alone. And you sit at his feet with an open Bible and you listen to him. Watch this. Day by day by day by day by day by day. I have two daughters that had the incredible privilege of growing up in a home I've lived with their mother 
longer than they have. This June, Debbie and I will be married 48 years. And if she's ever missed a day where she did not get her Bible and sit and listen to Jesus, I don't know about that day. And that is what has made Debbie whatever she is before the Lord. And you know, the Lord has used that as a conviction in the early years and still to this day. Because when I, and I preach every Sunday just about, but I don't study to preach sermons. Now I'm preaching a sermon now, but I don't, I don't open my Bible and, and, and study so that I can come out here and preach a sermon. I open this book because I want to get to know my God. And when I get to know my God, then when I come to this pulpit, there's something worth listening to. And the reality is my, these messages that I preach week after week after week, before they're ever preached to you, God's preached them to me. Well, there's a third thing. Not only who was this woman, she was a very ordinary woman. She had penetrating insight. But notice the third question, where did she do it? Where did she do it? And the answer is this, in the midst of criticism. She did this in the midst of criticism. Look at verse 4. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. I mean, the whole time she's doing this, they're talking about her. Verse 6, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. It's very obvious that they're going at her, man, because Jesus said that to him. I mean, they're, they're, they're criticizing her. I put in your notes, <clears throat> if you really want to make your life count, you're going to have to forget the opinions of other people. You see, this world, this world system is trying to do this to your life. It's trying to squeeze you into its mold. By the way, you know who the chief one who was criticizing her? You know where it all started? It was Judas Iscariot who later betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Over in John chapter 12, Judas says this, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And John wrote this, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put into it. I put in your notes in that box. She was criticized, and so will you be. In fact, so will anybody who wants to do something that will count for eternity. I mean, it wasn't enough that the Pharisees criticized a person like Mary who loved Jesus. I mean, they were on the outside, but, but now the, the disciples are criticizing her, and they're on the inside. You know, some churches are cursed with what I call a cold water committee. You know, they, the watchdogs that are on the sideline that always gripe. George Barna, a number of years ago, did a study, and it was uh, called Successful Churches. And he said every single successful church that he studied had the absence of a veto group. You know... Somebody or somebody's that say, well, as long as I'm here, there's never going to be a unanimous vote. Man, I just want to thank you for making this ministry one that strives for excellence in the presence of a holy God. But let me give you a fair warning in your personal life. You're never going to do anything worthwhile for Jesus without being criticized. So you got to understand that. You're never going to do anything worthwhile for Jesus without somebody criticizing you. And you're never going to do anything worthwhile for Jesus 
if you're worried about what other people are going to say. D.L. Moody, that great preacher, Dwight L. Moody said, if nobody ever has anything to say against you, your Christianity isn't worth much. Well, this cynicism becomes contagious. The other Gospels, like John, as we just read, Judas started, he was leading the charge, but a solo of cynicism had turned into a chorus of criticism. You know, there's a message for our fellowship. Never permit a critical spirit to come into this fellowship. There's a message for your home. Never, say the word never. Never Never permit a critical spirit to come into your home. For those of you particularly that still have children at home, never let them hear critical stuff come out of your mouth. You see, the world thinks this. The world thinks anything that you do for Jesus is a waste. I mean, if a man is brilliant, a young guy is brilliant, or a young lady is is brilliant, um, well, then they're encouraged to be a a doctor or a lawyer or, or something. But if that young man or young lady wants to be a missionary or the young man wants to be a pastor, people think, what a waste. What a waste. I'm convinced that anything you don't do for Jesus is a waste. Let me say to every young adult, whether you're single or married today and you got your life ahead of you, it's never a waste to pour out your life and give your best to Jesus. You know what's interesting? The word waste there in verse number, in in Mark 14, verse uh, number four, that word waste is the same word that Jesus used in John chapter 17 to describe uh, Judas. In other words, Judas criticized Mary because she was wasting money. Jesus pointed out to Judas that he had wasted his entire life. Incidentally, You notice how Mary handled the criticism? She did a very wise thing. She kept quiet, and she let Jesus defend her. I put in your notes, let Jesus defend you. Listen, when your motives are right, and your methods are pure, and you're doing what you do just because you love Jesus. As far as I'm concerned, you never have to explain anything to anybody. I put in, the, in, in that box in your notes, you'll never, say the word never. never, you'll never do anything that will amount to anything until you get your eyes off of the critics and get them on to Jesus. Who was this person? Very ordinary. Mary was a very ordinary person. She had personal insight. And where did she do this? In the midst of criticism. Notice number four, the question, when did she do it? Verse number eight. Jesus said, she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. The answer, when did she do it? She did what she could. She did what she could when she could. You see, somehow Mary knew that Jesus was facing Calvary and it broke her heart. And now she has brought, look at this. Her heart is breaking and she goes Home and she brings back to Simon the leper's house where Jesus is this alabaster box, the most priceless treasure she possessed. And she is now pouring that ointment over Jesus. If she had waited, she, had, she would have been too late because in a week Jesus was crucified. You see, do what, do what you can when you can because opportunities, some of them never come again. 
And Mary did what she could when she could. But there's a personal application here for each of us, and I put it in your box. And that is there is a sense in which all of us need to be preparing people for death. That's what Mary was doing. I can imagine. I mean, when you study and you, fig, you, you find out what that spikenard, that pure nard was, oh, the fragrance. It was a thick ointment. And it came from India. And uh, I mean, it, 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 if, if, if it was put anywhere on a person, it, it wasn't like cologne or perfume that you put on and you, know, you hope it lasts a few hours. This man, it would fill the house. It would last for days and days, this, this incredible, uh, rich, wonderful smell. And I've often wondered, that while they were hammering the nails into Jesus and the crown of thorns on his head and the blood coming down, I would not be at all surprised if even on the cross that spikenard was not mixed with that blood and Jesus was reminded and blessed by a lady who had given the most priceless possession and gave it all to Jesus. And there is a sense that all of us need to be preparing people for death. I remember in my former pastorate, I got a phone call one evening from an individual, excuse me, one morning from an individual and said, Pastor, my dad has died and he's in hell. He said, I, I never witnessed to him and he's in hell. I said, listen, your dad's not in hell. I went to see your dad last night in the hospital and your dad prayed and asked Jesus into his heart. And your dad today is in heaven, but I said in a very kind, but a very firm way, but if it had been left up to you, he'd be in hell today. Now spend the rest of your life not keeping your mouth shut, but be willing to tell people about Jesus what he did for them, what he'll do for them. Because one of these days, it'll be too late, folks, to prepare your friends for burying. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 says, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Mary knew Jesus was going to be crucified. And so she gave her very best and she, she poured it over his head and over his feet and wiped it off of his feet because she knew he was going to die. Listen, you and I know our friends are going to die. Some of us have individuals in our own extended family that have never opened their heart to Jesus. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Here's what I want to say to each of us. In a sense, in a sense, every one of us ought to be preparing our friends for burial. But not only when did she do it, but the fifth question is what did she do? What was it that so impressed Jesus that he said in verse number nine, wherever this gospel is preached, this will be told as a memorial to her. Here's the answer to that, folks. Here's the answer of what she did. She did all. Say the word all. She did all she could. She held back nothing. Nothing. 
I think of that great hymn. Listen to these words. The songwriter said, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What was Mary actually communicating? I put it in that box in your notes. Everything I have, Lord, is at your disposal. Everything I have, Lord, is at your disposal. As I was asking the Lord how to end this service, The Lord said, Ken, what I want you to do is I want you to just say to the people, are you willing to say to Jesus, all that I have, Lord, is at your disposal. Do with them, do with it. Do with everything, whatever you so choose. Moms, dads, that means your children. If God wants to take them for his glory and his service, it's up to God, whatever God wants to do. I remember my father saying, Kenny, I'd rather see you on the other side of the world where I don't get to see you, but you're in the will of God than living at that house right across the street and not living for God. Everything I have, Lord, is at your disposal. Here's my marriage, Lord. Make me the best husband I can be. Make me the best wife that I can be. Make me the best father, the best mother that I can be. Make me the best, make me a, make me a child that honors my father and mother before it's too late. Lord, everything I have is at your disposal. My finances, I'll manage them at your disposal. They're, they're yours. Everything I have, everything I have, everything I have. Listen, Jesus is either Lord of all, or practically speaking, he's not Lord at all in your life. He is Lord. He's Lord whether any of us ever acknowledge it or not. In fact, there is coming a day when we will stand before the Lord and we will honor him as Lord. But man, oh man, let's let him have first place in all of our life. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Ken, you're, some of you are thinking, you, you don't know what my marriage is like, or you don't know what this is like, or you don't know what my parents are like, or you don't know how little I have. That's not the issue. This lady, this message was so important that Jesus said, wherever the gospel, there is nothing in all the world that's more important than the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's it, folks. That's how anyone gets to heaven. And Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, what this lady has done will be spoken of as a memorial. One woman's 
memorial. I may not be much, but I am one. And by the grace of God, I want to be all this one can be. But I'll never be able to be all this one can be unless he has all of me. Does he have all of you? Let him have it, man. Put your life on the altar and say, Jesus, you have all of me. I don't know what all this means, Lord, quite frankly. I'm a little concerned, maybe a little scared, but I just know this. I'm tired of living with one foot in and one foot out. I'm tired of living wanting to be something but unwilling to meet you on the terms where I could be everything you wanted me to be. Here's where it all boils down. May Jesus be able to say about you, and about me. They did what they could. She did what she could do. He did what he could do. You know what she did? She gave her all to Jesus. Father, on this Mother's Day, would you take this message and so weave it in the lives of men that they give to their wife and the mother of their children a man who is literally willing to be spent for you, Jesus. And for every lady here today, May there be no lady that walks out of here thinking that she is anything less than the most precious commodity to Jesus. Jesus died for every lady here and man and son and daughter, every boy, every girl, and so, Jesus, you loved us so much that it demands our life, our all. May we just simply live our life like that. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And everyone said, amen.